Yes. Sound ferociously sad to some. It can even make some of you recoil and move backwards. Death is final. Death is the end. That death is, in Dutch language, kaput. When you think about it, why is it that there are cultures in the world where the very idea of death repulses us, pushes us away? If you happen to live in America and you die, you often hear people saying, it's a matter of time, you'll get over it. It's just a question of time. Or if you happen to live in the Netherlands and I go up to my student who has just announced, I'm late because my grandmother died and I go up to him and want to embrace him, all of a sudden he pushes away and he says, but she was old anyway. So you get these feelings where emotion is missing from the act of death. And you wonder why is it so repulsive to touch a skull, to feel the person dying next to you, or to hear about the neighbor's pain as he or she witnesses his mother or his ancestors dying in front of him. Well, I happen to be from a culture where the idea of death is not repulsive, but in fact, one that should be embraced. And it is a culture that is so grounded on this notion of death that we, in fact, think about it in three elements. One, that it is, as Patricia Fernandez Kelly tells us, a culture that can be accepted because, in fact, we all know that we will die, but we know that in the process of dying, we engage others and we want them to be part of that life. So we accept death as something that we are all destined to have, but in the way that we die, in the memories that we leave, that is what makes us uniquely important for those people. So in Mexico, we think about our dead, and we think about them in the sense that we have marvelous emotions, in the sense of a country that brings out the very best for its dead, because it's a cyclical episode. We are born to die, and in the process of being born, we're already witnessing our own death. And this cyclical cycle is repeated from pre-Hispanic periods with the idea that the best thing in one's life is the sacrifice that one might make. And in so doing, what better yet to be able to die knowing that you've given some of yourself to others? So we go on this day to the cemeteries in Mexico, we wash the cemeteries, we bring food to our dead, and we bring the flowers that they loved or they smelled. And in so doing, we also bring those very special flowers, which you find, by the way, here in the Netherlands. You have the celosia, which is the bird's cock, the crest of the rooster, and we also have the africanches. And if you were to take the africanches and press them between your hands, they have such a peculiar scent, a marvelous scent, that the spirits are guided into your house where those scents are, and they welcome you. So the africanches becomes our flower of the dead. We carry it, we use it, and we make our altars. And our altars are made with the idea of reaching heaven. Because for Mexicans, it's the fusion of the Catholic Church religious cult, and it is the indigenous uh, kinds of behaviors and rituals that we've had that we've combined. So the arch represents the heaven, the table represents the altar. We must have salt, and we must have water because the dead are thirsty, and they need to make sure their food is properly seasoned. So they bring, we bring the food, the favorite things that they would all like, and as we place them in the altars, even with paper flowers, if we can't afford the other flowers, we make sure that our houses have altars that represent their spirit, that they are always welcome. 
And in this motif, my own altar here, with the toys that I used to play with, with the picture of my aunt, and the skulls. The skulls that can laugh because they are husband and wife, but they're dead to the world. But they can also represent the laughing matter of death. The idea that, yes, we confront death. There is a moment where death gives us the right to be socially equalized. Both those of you who are rich here and those of you who are poor will end up in the same place. So the idea is you may have a fancy to your background, but you will be like the rest of us. So here in this image, which is especially important, are my grandparents. Don Vicente on the horse, and that is not a dead horse. That's a real horse, okay? And then my grandmother, but it, if you watch her, Doña Librada Lopez de Cuevas, you'll notice she has a child in her lap. And if you look intently, the child is dead. That is Gloria, the aunt I never got to meet, who died at eight months of age. And the custom in Mexico is to always represent them with a picture to capture their essence and to keep them alive. So that is my grandmother and my grandfather. And of course, you cannot go to the underworld if you don't have a guide. So from the pre-Hispanic times, what we have received is the Xolosquintle, which is a hairless Mexican dog, famous throughout the world, but especially famous for the Aztecs because it is a dog that is your guide, the brother of Quetzalcoatl, who will take you to the underworld. And today, if I don't have a real dog, at least I have my wooden dog from Oaxaca that represents my guide to that world. And often they would be buried with the priestess or the important people because that is the way that they would take them on their journey. And of course, you cannot have a day of the dead without having el pan de muertos. El pan de muertos represents the skull, the brain, with the crossbones on the top. And by the way, that is handmade by moi. So it begins to be an especially important one because it shows how we consume the bread which has these wonderful aromas made with actually with the essence of flowers. And as we consume it, we are also eating with the dead. And the pan de muertos, by the way, there are now over five bakeries in the Netherlands that are producing them on November the 2nd, and you can find them. But this is the ritual of consuming the bread with champurrado, which is chocolate gruel made with maize. So, no dead will be happy if he doesn't have his mole. And the mole is made from the rich, delicate uh, chocolate mixed in with chili peppers, mixed in with nuts and peanuts, and this concoction made really for the gods and made actually for the kings of Spain at one point are what the dead enjoy. And we must bring them out and of course, my father would not be happy without his bottle of whiskey. And my mother would need her tequila and her little tequila shot. So these are the things that come into the altar but give us a sense of who we are. Why is this important? Because it goes back to three traditions of Mexico. The pre-Hispanic tradition of the Sopatli where the exhibition of skulls were done as a signal of sacrifice that in the world that we live in, we really render ourselves helpless unless we have sacrifice. And the idea was that both women and men, especially the men who were in war, in battles, who died, would be represented in the skull racks. And women who gave birth and at the same time lost their lives would be represented as warriors themselves. So it is a tradition that goes back to pre-Hispanic times and gives us a sense of continuity today and at the same time allows us, if I can make this move, ooh, it got stuck there. It moves us into the next slide, which even though it's not here, 
I know it's the cross because we have the fusion of the Mesoamerican, ah, there, with the fusion of the cross. And the cross obviously represents Adam's bones. The idea was the cross came from Europe, but what the Europeans brought was they substituted the quattle, the snake of the Indians, with the fat little cherubs from Europe. They substituted the cross with the skull in the middle. And it is this fusion, this idea of mixing, of commingling cultures that becomes so important. And then we have the third period of our lives, which is the popular culture of the 19th century, where you have Jose Guadalupe Posada, one of our best lithographers, deciding to represent the Mexican as he or he, he saw her. And in this case, is the Catrina Garbancera. Garbanzo comes from the chickpea, and the idea is that these were women who were very poor, but in trying to show that they had status, they dressed up like the Catrinas, the great elegant ladies, with the hats, with the veils, and with the shawls. So that is the idea of the Catrina Garbancera, which we again celebrate, and throughout Mexico you will see carpets made of the flowers with representations throughout, with the papel picado, which is a paper that has little holes inserted in it so that the wind can blow, and with the cempasuchito as a way to attract the spirits and make them welcome. And of course, today, in 2015, what has happened? Spectre has come about, and we now have an annual parade in Mexico City made true by the James Bond movie. And of course, we just celebrated Coco. And in this sense, they've gone viral. They've gone global. It's no longer simply a statement of Mexicans. It is that in 2003, basically, we have given the heritage of patrimony of humanity to the El Dia de los Muertos in Mexico, and we live through that. These are two significant days. The first is the day for the children who come with their white clothing, and we have everything in white. And the second, which is a day for the adults. The Catholic Church had only one, the Indians had two. The pre-Hispanic Indians, Aztecas, had one for the children and one for the adults. And in the second, that's when we celebrate wholeheartedly what this festival means, because it is the rejoining of the spirits who come to us, eat with us, dance with us, laugh with us, cry with us, mock with us, and even have a chance to create them in sugar skulls, the skulls which are found in the marketplaces. Do you know what it feels to have an enemy that you can put their name on that sugar skull, like Pepe, and when you bite it in for the first time, you can feel the power of your bite. It is that sense of being able to consume Pepe as a sugar skull, and you find them throughout the countryside and everywhere. So today, what we see in Mexico is a revival of the Catrina, made famous first by Jose Guadalupe Posada, and later on by Diego Rivera in his famous painting in 1947, which was made as a mural. And as you see her, she stands elegant, beautiful, dignified, even though we know she's a skull, which we will all end up being. But she celebrates this sense of life and death and that mortality. So for us, for those of you who are bikers, you also will be like this. So in a way, this is a representation that even in modern Mexico at the time that Posada lived, the bikers were a new intrusion into the country. So even the bikers will end up being skulls. And we can laugh, we can mock, we can even create poems that are called calaveras, which are limericks that bring to the fore all the inequalities of human life, but at the same time the sentiment of laughter and play. So for us, the Mexicans, as Octavio Paz so gallantly did in 1964, the word death is not pronounced in New York. 
in Paris, in London, because it burns the lips. The Mexican, in contrast, is familiar with death, jokes about it, caresses it. It is one of its favorite toys and its most steadfast love. So I leave you with the thought of death as embracing all of you. Feliz Dia de Muertos a la Mexicana. Thank you.